Canada is known around the world for its natural beauty, harsh winters, bitter cold temperatures, and their iconic sled dogs. Unmatched by any machine, these lightning fast canines thrive in the coldest Arctic temperatures. Even the Inuit people today will typically pick a dog team over a snow machine. The dogs always know which way is home. The dogs will protect you if they need to. So your snow machine is pretty much useless compared to the dogs. It will probably break down and at minus 45 Celsius, I bet you it won't start. The Canadian Inuit Husky is known to be the original sled dog. And that makes them Canada's first working dog. They were used for everything, anything. Wherever you needed to have a working hand, the dogs were there to do it. And the best part about them is they're paid with hugs and kisses and they just wanted to do whatever you asked them to do. Pointers point, retrievers retrieve, border collies herd, these guys run. And they, all they care about is running as far as they can, as fast as they can do it. And it's just something that's been bred into them for hundreds of years. So this is Knight. Uh, Knight is an Alaskan Husky. Uh, he is currently my top male lead dog in the kennel. And uh, when you look at him, he doesn't look like he would be anything special, but he is the champion here. They share all height and traits of a wolf, so power, endurance, um, intelligence, real good thick double coat and sense of smell. The person guiding the sled is referred to as a musher, and it's their job through intense training to harness the natural strength of these dogs. Most importantly though, the musher learns the personality of each dog and decides where they fit on the team. You know, if I wanted to take a a fast team of dogs, I know who I'd want to lead it, right? I would take Knight. It takes a certain type of personality to be in charge. But then as the team gets further back, your dogs get bigger and stronger, so that's where you'd put your bigger boys. They're called wheel dogs. Conan, for example, is my top wheel dog, and you know, it, it, you just feel privileged to be his friend because he's so shy. Although his name would inspire a powerful reputation, he's a big baby. We do what we do for our dogs because we love them. They're our most loyal friends. Um, and they might not care that I paint their dog houses for them. They don't care that we plant flowers in the kennel. None of that matters to them. It matters to us though. I feel better knowing that my dogs have the best feed available, that their bowls get washed every day. And there's a byproduct, my dogs are beautiful. They're super happy, they're super friendly. Medrick Cousineau and Brenda Anderson have something in common. They each count on a service dog to enjoy a better quality of life. Relying on a dog for support is something Medrick thought he would never do. I guess in the military, uh, you, you begin to believe, because you have to believe that you're 10 feet tall and bulletproof. Uh, it's the way it works. It, it's what allows you to do things that other people don't. For Medrick, Enjoying a peaceful walk outside was a luxury which eluded him for more than a decade. And for a day's work, that's an unfortunate price to pay. In October 1986, Lieutenant Cousineau volunteered to repel from a Sea King helicopter onto the deck of an American sword fishing vessel. During that rescue, he battled seas that were more than 10 meters high. It was a dark and stormy night and uh, it didn't play out well. I guess in some ways it depends on your buy-in in certain things. How, how deeply are you invested? And uh, at that particular night, uh, you know, to use a poker expression, I was all in. We medevaced two American sword fishermen. I actually held these guys in my arms. I'm holding them. I'm trying to get them into the medical equipment. I'm trying to get them back onto the helicopter. At the end of the day, we were able to, uh, to pull it off and get the two guys. And uh, that night, um, when it was all said and done, and the next day, uh, as the events unfolded, uh, I realized that maybe I wasn't 10 feet tall and bulletproof anymore. Post-traumatic stress disorder 
is unpredictable. The side effects can overwhelm someone in just a matter of seconds. Sensing the changes in body chemistry will make a service dog respond to their handler when they experience symptoms of PTSD. And that's why Medrick has Ty, his 24-7 companion who is always by his side. We were just actually we had our dog socializing for a bit and we were sitting talking when his dog initially put his paws on Medrick's lap and then flipped over on its back and started spinning on his back. Uh, this is all in 10 to 15 seconds. When Medrick speaks up and says, it's okay, Ty, daddy's back. At which point I ask, what was that? Because it kind of blew my mind. And Medrick just simply said to me, uh, just had a flashback. And he said, now you asked me what my dog does. That's what my dog does. So Ty, in turn, will do whatever to get Medrick to focus on the dog and take the focus off himself. While physical injuries can leave visible scars, those with mental illness deal with problems that are less apparent. Their families found them uh, distant. They found them that they, that they had very little memory, that they jumped easily, were startled very easily, could not handle any type of noise, and that they often couldn't socialize anymore. Um, and, and that's the nucleus of PTSD. Sometimes the, uh, the things that can happen in your mind can create prisons that are far worse than anything that we could create with, with bars and concrete. When you don't see any sunshine, after a while you stop looking for it, and the world becomes a really dark place. Now I have Ty, and uh, she gets me out of the house, she gets me in a, in a much better headspace and a, in a much better place. It's a good girl. Most of the dogs came out to meet their new handler and they were very nonchalant. Except for Ty and uh, she started about four large lunge steps away. Uh, had no, I had no idea she was mine. I didn't know how she knew I was hers. My introduction to Ty was, uh, this is your dog Ty and then I disappeared in a, uh, a flurry of wet slobbery kisses and uh, wagging tails and excitement. The problem with, um, with something as complex as, as PTSD is it has a whole laundry list of other major disorders that come along as side effects. Uh, panic, anxiety, depression, agoraphobia, anger, irritability, I mean, it, you know, it's, it's, it's really not a pretty landscape. Even though Medrick made it back alive that night, to this day, his mind continues to return to that rescue. People with PTSD, the brain rewires part of itself. And um, I think they sink into a despair, a depression, because there really isn't a light at the end of the tunnel. There's not a whole lot of positive. If someone's anxiety is going up and up and up, the dog is trained to interrupt that thought and bring them back down. Ty serves as a grounding mechanism and, and um, after I get her settled and calmed down and she's satisfied that I'm back on course, um, it can be as dramatic as flipping off a light switch. Maybe we can cut down on the amount of medication that somebody has to take. Maybe uh, we can remove some of the loneliness. Maybe they'll feel better about coming forward with their illness because everyone wants a friend and, uh, and they can be marvelous friends as well as work dogs. Using quality of life as a metric, I think the evidence is indisputable. And, uh, and now there are avenues open that make dogs like Ty a cost-effective solution.
you know, this dog changed the life of this individual. Can you deny this? No. But if it changed the life of this person that was suicidal before, it counts, it does. And that's the clinical significance of it, as opposed to the scientific or statistical significance. Each day as we, uh, as we train together and, and get our relationship sort of, the bond deepens and the uh, what I need, what she needs, how we need to do this together, each day gets just a little bit easier. Good girl. Ready? Go get it. Find it. Brenda has been a guide and a friend to Medrick, but she also has a guide of her own, Noble. I became aware in 2002 that not only was I not going to get any vision back, I was also made aware at that point that I was in the process of becoming totally blind. I have uh, an eye condition which is being caused by a brain condition and there's nothing they can do to uh, retract it. Um, there's nothing they can do to improve the eye condition itself. So right now I'm in the process of becoming totally blind. I have to maintain a very vigorous physical lifestyle for, to keep my health in shape. And because of my lifestyle, I need Noble to be guiding me. Brenda's loss of sight has been a gradual process. It's taken place over a span of three decades. The life that Brenda wants to lead would not be possible without a service dog. For me, my independence is far more important than my limited vision. Um, I've been visually impaired for 36 years. For me, I find it easy to live with, but if I lost my independence, that's not on the agenda. When you think of dogs on the job, Noble is probably the most recognizable example, a guide dog. You've probably witnessed one of these amazing dogs and their handlers at least once in your travels. These dogs are important because they become their handler's eyes. When my vision is so limited, uh, he's able to get me to and from wherever I have to go. He lets me know when I come to stairs, when I come to step off a curb. Uh, he stops before I cross streets. If I start to cross the street in a crosswalk and a vehicle, he senses the vehicle is not going to stop. He will block me. He will put himself out ahead of me so the car will get him first. Like us, every dog needs a break, some quality time off. They need some dog time. So the harness goes on, it's my time. When the harness is off, it's his time. Bring it in. He has a stance when he's not dressed, he is a dog. Now when I put the harness on, his stance changes. He knows he's in work mode. It's like having two dogs. As much as it's important for him to work, which is his main focus, he still needs dog time. And it's explained to us through the training program, a dog who has dog time and has some free time makes a much better worker. He does not like to be left at home. I've had some incidences where each one of my garbage cans has been knocked over. He had stripped my bed, my duvet, my pillows, everything is thrown on the floor. When I went to see him, he was on his mat, and I speak to him like, what, why did you do that? And he rolls his head and he, and he's trying to talk to me like, you left me home. <laughs> and you know, <laughs> you can't be mad at him. <laughs> you cannot be mad at these dogs.